Okay, good, we can see it. Right. So let's get to the presentation. Uh, so first of all, uh, I am not a, uh, I don't st study literary science. I am a botanist, so I will be talking about this side of things. Uh, because also Tolkien uh, was, uh, first of all, a philologist, uh, but he was a great fan of botany. Uh, so he had a, this botany and study of plants as a hobby. So I am a botanist who has Tolkien as a hobby. Uh, and Tolkien uh, uh, did leave several uh, letters and uh, indications uh, that he really uh, loved plants, like uh, this quote from uh, uh, one of his let letters. Uh, he says, I'm obviously mad in love with plants and above all trees and always have been. And I find human maltreatment of them as hard to bear as some fine ill treatment of animals. So that's, that's a sentiment I share with him as well. Uh, I'm also a dendrologist, so I, I uh, focus on the study of trees. Uh, and uh, uh, he also had a favorite tree uh, in the bot botanic garden of the Oxford University. Uh, it was a black pine, a uh, very beautiful tree, uh, which sadly uh, broke in uh, 2014. Uh, and therefore it had to be cut down from these natural cases. Uh, but it was uh, treated, uh, treated uh, very respectfully and it was uh, made into some uh, uh, pretty things and uh, sold as token memorabilia. So uh, that was his very favorite tree, which might be inspiration for several trees in Middle Earth and uh, for uh, some races like ants. And uh, I really agree with him uh, that trees are very impressive and they are worth our uh, admiration. For example, uh, uh, this uh, sequoia, giant, the giant sequoias uh, in America uh, is one of the biggest organisms, uh, if you take non clonal organisms on Earth. Uh, the, which if you would, would uh, just take the mass of the wood, it has uh, over uh, 1,300 uh, cubic meters of wood. Uh, there are some of the oldest organisms on our air. Uh, These uh, pine trees uh, from a species Pinus longa eva, or in Latin, literally long lived pine, uh, in white mountains in California can reach ages up to 5,000 years. Uh, and if you take the, their uh, possible clonality into account, meaning that from uh, one root system, you can get several uh, trees which share the same genetic material. Uh, you get uh, trees like this pando, which is Populus tremuloides, and a quaking aspen uh, in Oregon, uh, where, uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry, in Utah, uh, where it covers uh, uh, great, uh, great, uh, uh, area and uh, its estimated age is up to 80,000 years. Uh, this is the biggest, the tree with the biggest diameter uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, it's uh, called Montezuma Cypress. Uh, it's, it's the diameter is uh, over 44 meters. So they are really uh, very uh, impressive organisms, and Tolkien was right in admiring them. Uh, but uh, this admiration uh, goes even deeper. Uh, he's, he uh, saw it's his own work uh, as a tree. Uh, in the leaf of uh, Nigel, which is a short story uh, by Tolkien, uh, we have uh, a very thinly veiled metaphor of a painter uh, which is almost like a writer writing his, his own uh, magnum opus. And about this painter, he says he had a number of pictures on hand. Most of them were too large and ambitious for his skill. That's how he saw himself. Uh, he was the sort of painter who can paint leaves better than trees. He used to spend a long time on a single leaf trying to catch its shape and its sheen and a glistening of dew drops on its edges. If he wanted to pay a whole tree with all of its leaves and the same style and all of them different. 
There was one picture in particular which bothered him. It had begun with a leaf caught in the wind, and it became a tree, and the tree grew, sending out innumerable branches and thrusting out the most fantastic roots. So that was his middle air, a tree, uh, sending out new and new branches. Uh, it was a lifelong work of his, and uh, as he uh, correctly predicted, he didn't finish in his life. Uh, this is a motif he uh, often uh, also drew on, on his uh, when he scribbled something or uh, as a doodle. Uh, he often drew this tree, uh, which is named the Tree of Amalion. Amalion is no place in Middle Earth; it's just, just the name of this tree. But you can notice. Uh, what what he talked about in this uh, in this leaf by Nigel, uh, there every every leaf every flower is different, and yet he knows the structure. When he reproduces it in different media in different papers, it it has always the same curvature. It has the same arrangement of uh, flowers. Sometimes new flowers emerge, but uh, the main ones stay in the same places. So that's, that's how he saw his own work as a ever branching tree, always uh, sending out new branches and new roots. But let's get inside this uh, legendarium of his, this tree that he created, and look at the uh, role of plants uh, in this creative world. And when we are talking about plants, we need to st start uh, with the name Yavana Kementari, uh, which uh, the Valar uh, were like uh, the godlike forces, forces of nature in Middle Earth. And Yavana uh, was the spouse of Aule, the giver of fruits. Uh, she is the lover of all things that grow in the earth and all their countless forms she holds in her mind. From the trees like towers in forests long ago, to the moss upon stones, or the small and secret things in the mall. So this is uh, the source of all the plant life in Arda. Uh, all plants, of, and possibly also animals, come from her mind, her imagination. So this is the genetic engineer of Arda. She has to keep in mind all the different shapes and DNA codes of all the different animals and plants that live in the mid in Middle Earth. She is the creator of all, all life besides the intelligent races. But uh, in in botany, uh, there it, it's it's uh, quite rare to find a plant with with name inspired by Tolkien. Uh, unlike in uh, in zoology, there are several species of spiders and. Uh, and butterflies named after Tolkien's uh, characters. Uh, in, in botany, it's mostly cultivars, like a, an orchid cultivar named Shilop, Shilop, because it resembles a spider, for example. Uh, but this, this plant is named in honor of Yavana, uh, Yavana Himerica. It's not a current plant. Uh, it's an early Cretaceous tree fern. Uh, from the order Ciateales, which is a current order, you can still find representatives of this order in the tropics, because there are tropical tree-like ferns uh, growing in warm areas. And in, in uh, Cretaceous, uh, it was so much warmer than today, so you can find such, such tree-like ferns uh, in, on the islands of Antarctica. So the fossils of this plant were, were found in 2013 in the scrape named uh, by a uh, paleontologist named Vera in honor of Yavana. Let's, let's start uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, history of Middle Earth in the so-called Spring of Arda. Spring of Arda was the time uh, when living things created by Yavana started to grow, but there were no intelligent races yet. The quote in the Silmarillion about this is, uh, then the seeds that Yavana had sown began swiftly to sprout and to burgeon. And there arose a multiple of growing things, great and small mosses and grasses and grain ferns and trees whose tops were crowned with clouds as they were living mountains. 
but whose feet were wrapped in a green twilight. Uh, another quote, as yet no flower had bloomed, nor any bird had sung, for these things waited still their time in the bosom of Yavana. I don't know if this is intentional or if it's a coincidence. I'm not sure if Tolkien knew the uh, evolutionary history of plants, uh, but this, according to this description, uh, the spring of Arda corresponds exactly with the, or more or less exactly, uh, with the end of Paleozoic and the beginning of Mesozoic era. Uh, there is one exception. All of these uh, uh, plants that, uh, that were mentioned here, so mosses, green ferns, and trees, with the exception of grasses, were present here in the end of Paleozoic and beginning of Mesozoic. But there were no flowering plants yet, because they, they developed later in Mesozoic, in the time of dinosaurs, when also the uh, coevolution with insects happened. So the flowering plants evolved in, with, in coevolution with insects, with uh, bees and different pollinating species in the Mesozoic. The light source in this uh, time period in Middle Earth were the great lamps, Iluin and Orma. But Melkor, the, the main uh, big villain, uh, broke these lamps and ended the spring of Arda because without light, you don't you have no photosynthesis. So the plants can't live without this light. And Yavana made her creations fall asleep. So this uh, breaking of lamps uh, is exactly this end of Paleozoic and beginning of Mesozoic because this, uh, uh, this break between these two periods is marked with a uh, so-called Great Permian Extinction. It was an event uh, whereby uh, great volcanic activity, you notice that the, the Melkor is uh, uh, the Vala which is responsible for volcanic activity, uh, it led to uh, a, ra a big rising of temperature on, on Earth, much bigger than, than we have today as global warming. Uh, which led to the extinction of uh, about 90% of species of living organisms. So these great extinctions can be really uh, put in, into the, the history of Arda as the breaking of this uh, light source, lamps, Iluin and Orma. But let's re return, return to this underlined sentence. There were trees whose tops were crowned with clouds as they were living mountains. So in the spring of Arda, we had gigantic trees. Let's, let's just ask a question. How high can a tree grow in our world? There is a certain limitation of height. You don't, you don't get trees that are like this, that are as big as mountains. Um, let's, let's say four, four, 100, 500 meters big, maybe 1,000. You, you don't get trees like this today. That's because uh, there is a limitation to this height, which is hydraulic. Uh, it means uh, the tree, tree can grow higher than it's able to get water. And how does it transport water? Uh, it's uh, thanks to the evaporation of water from the leaves through the stomata. This evaporation uh, creates pressure which, which through uh, adhesive and co cohesive forces in the vessels uh, pulls the water up from the roots. roots. Like, uh, you can imagine it like uh, when you are drinking from, from a straw. Uh, problem happens uh, when this water column gets interrupted. It's called cavitation. And uh, if, if, if it can just happen, with, uh, happen that a uh, single air bubble forms inside this uh, uh, vessel of the plant. And the whole water column collapses. So to prevent this creation of air bubbles, if the evaporation happens too fast, if, for example, the air is too dry, then the tree closes the stomata to avoid the breaking of this water column. 
uh, but the higher up the tree, then the the sooner the stomata must close at higher humidity because the force to, uh, needed to draw the water to this height is bigger. So, and if you can't open the stomata for longer than maybe 10 minutes a day, then there is no point in, in even creating leaves there because they can't photosynthesize. So the, the growth slows down and uh, the calculated uh, height of the tree based on this physical limitation uh, is maximum of uh, 120 to 130 meters, which corresponds to the actual measured uh, highest trees, which uh, currently is uh, Sequoia, uh, named, nicknamed Hyperion, with a height of uh, 115 and 17 meters. Uh, but uh, another species holds the historical record, but it was cut down. It was the Douglas fir. Uh, which the which was the highest measure once one what was 126.5 meters, but the measurement is a bit uncertain because they just uh, measure it in feet with no no uh, measuring tape. And the highest confirmed one was uh, 100, almost 120 meters. That's that's how much trees can can grow in our world. But obviously, the trees in the spring of Arda were much higher. So how, how can, could a tree get bigger like this? We either need lower gravity, which we have no record about in the Middle Earth. But uh, since it's based on our world, we can assume uh, that the gravity was more or less the same. Uh, and, the, and the other option that we can get uh, is some, somehow actively transporting the water from the roots. Not just rely on these physical forces pulling the water up, uh, but have some heart or some organ like a heart at the base of the roots, which would push the water upwards. So the gigantic trees in the spring of our Arda possibly had hearts. But the spring of Arda ended by the breaking of uh, these lumps, Illuin and Ormal, and the Valar uh, pondered some new light source. And uh, again, uh, Yavana came with the solution and planted two trees, Telperion and Laurelin, in the land of Valinor, where this, this Valar lived. Uh, and about these trees, so Marion says that one had leaves of dark green, but beneath were a shining silver. And from each of his countless flower, a dew of silver light was ever falling, and the earth beneath was dappled with the shadow of its fluttering leaves. The other bore leaves of a young green, like the new open beach. Their edges were of glittering gold. Flowers swung upon her branches in cluster, clusters of yellow flame, formed each to a glowing horn that spilled a golden rain upon the ground, and from the blossom of that tree there came form, form, warmth and a great light. So these were, were the uh, trees that substituted uh, sun, the sun and the moon in Middle Earth for a long time. And uh, a possible inspiration for these trees is uh, from the medieval manuscript, The Wonders of the East. It's a manuscript uh, about Alexander the Great's journey to paradise, which was uh, supposedly placed somewhere beyond India, uh, where he saw two talking trees of the sun and moon dripping magical sap. This is a possible inspiration for uh, this equation of uh, a tree with a with source of light and uh, with the sun, of, sun and moon. Uh, this is the opening of, of uh, the flowers and uh, uh, the fruits of uh, these trees. So there was, if you can notice, there was no period of night in Middle Earth uh, or, of, or of no light. There was just mixing of lights where both of these trees were dim, but as one waned, the other wax. So the intensity of the light changed. Let's, let's see in our world if we can have something like this. Uh, if we can have some glowing plants that we, would give, give up light. 
on the principle of glowing things, uh, at least of glowing living things, uh, is the oxidation of a substrate called luciferin. As you know, Lucifer is the biblical name meaning the bearer of light. So that's that's how this substrate and enzyme were, were named. Luciferin is the substrate which is oxidized by the enzyme called luciferase. And this process releases a photon. So this is the sor source of biological light. And you can see it in some algae. Uh, the species of alga Noctulca scintillans it's, a, it's just a unicellular organism, but under mechanical stress, it uh, undergoes this process and releases photons. That's why, uh, when in some areas of the world, you can you can notice it as glowing tide. It doesn't glow uh, in the open water when where there is no mechanical stress, but as it the tide hits the rocks, it's it's a stress and they start glowing or when you are swimming in this water, then around you, it glows. Uh, in, similar, a sim in similar way, you can get glowing fungi, but they are not, not plants. Uh, fungi uh, from a, a systematic biology are closer to animals than plants. They use the same process, oxidation of luciferin, and we can take a gene from this fungi and uh, put it into plants, which was done uh, in the petunias quite recently. So you can you can get some glowing plants, but uh, not naturally, but by this genetic engineering. But as, as you can see, it's not, not a great source of light. Uh, it doesn't illuminate this person in the picture or, or properly. Uh, so the token trees, to, for them to, to shine this brightly, bioluminescence is not enough. So we need some other source, uh, possibly from physics. So some, somehow we probably need nuclear fusion inside these flowers and fruits for them to, to glow like this. But what, what was happening in Middle Earth while, the, while these trees were glowing uh, in Valinor? Uh, well, there was darkness. And after about 10,000 years of this darkness, uh, Varda, uh, uh, the valley of uh, stars, created, not light, created brighter stars. So starlight was the only light that Middle Earth got in this period. And uh, under the under star, starlight, elves awakened. And, at the shore of the lake Kuiviene, and then ants and dwarfs. Uh, but another period of about 10,000 years, uh, until the death of the trees and creation of the sun and, and moon, there was only this starlight as a source of light in Middle Earth. So as a botanist, this is quite baffling, because we, we know that there were people living there. They needed to eat something. So what was the base of the ecosystem uh, if we have no photosynthesis? If there was photosynthesis, it had to be based on this starlight, which is quite a poor source of light, but it's, it may be possible with some very simple organisms like cyanobacteria, which were the first photosynthetic of organism that were there were just bacteria. And uh, uh, nowadays, all the chloroplasts in all photosynthesizing plants have origin in this bacteria and in, in endosymbiosis. So the cell, uh, the eukaryotic cell, enveloped this photosynthesizing bacteria and got chloroplasts. Uh, but they can live in a very dim condition. Uh, they have special uh, additional pigments that enable them to uh, live in caves when there is just a little light. So this is a possible source of photosynthesis. Uh, but the food chain could be also based on the uh, on the non-decaying bio biomass of these dormant plants that Yavana uh, made fall asleep. Another source of energy could be geothermal energy, which is the source of energy in uh, deep, deep ocean ecosystems where no light can, uh, can reach. 
Again, uh, this geothermal energy, since it's connected to volcanic activity, comes from Melkor. So it would be quite interesting if this was the base of the ecosystem which nourished the first Alps. Or, of course, we have some uh, more esoteric options like Bretarianism and who knows what. So it, it was, or we can, we can just say magic. Uh, also, I was not get started about oxygen because uh, photosynthesis is the main source of oxygen and without photosynthesis, uh, the uh, concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere would sink very, very quickly. So if this happened in Middle Earth or if the photosynthesis from Valinor was enough to keep enough oxygen in, in, in the atmosphere of Arda, we don't know. But after this period of almost 20,000 years of darkness in Middle Earth, uh, the trees were killed again by Morgoth, who else, of course. Uh, and uh, from the last fruit of Laurelin, uh, the sun was created, guided by a Maya Arian. And the last flower of Telperion gave rise to, mo to the moon, guided by the Maya Tilion. You can see the sun and the moon uh, in this Tolkien's draw drawing of uh, Arda as a ship, which is also a in very interesting imaginary uh, in the earlier version of the Legendarium. Uh, but I, I discussed this, these ideas with some of my friends uh, who are uh, physicists, uh, and uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, this arrangement has a bit of a physical problem. Uh, because if we want Middle Earth to be similar to our Earth, and the, the sun of Middle Earth similar to our sun, uh, so th this means the same length of day and night, night, no noticeable changes in size during the day, then it should be in the height of at least 35,000 kilometers. And for it to be this high, the diameter must be about two to three hundred kilometers. So if, the, if this was the fruit of this tree, how big this was this tree? But let's, let's just again say it's magic. Look at two other trees in Middle Earth. One of the most famous ones that you can also see in uh, a lot of Middle Earth merchandise is the white tree. It is uh, the tree of Gondor. Uh, but it's a family tree, because this tree has a lineage, family tree reaches all the way uh, to this, uh, this uh, tree from which the moon uh, was created to Telperion. Not directly, uh, because uh, Galatilion was made in the picture of Telperion, so it's, it's not a direct descendant, and it was gifted by Yavanna to the uh, elves who came to Valinor because they wanted a, a tree similar to Telperion, but it didn't give its own life. From, from this, uh, Galatilion, the silver tree of Tol Evese, uh, sprouted. And from this, uh, another, another seedling was uh, brought to Numenor, Nimlot, and then several generations of uh, these white, white, this white trees in the uh, Middle Earth Minas Itil, which was uh, taken by dark forces and turned into Minas Morgul, so obviously the tree didn't survive there. Uh, it was brought to Minas Anor, which had, which became Minas Tirith, uh, and which, which uh, was dead in the time of uh, the events of the Lord of the Rings, but afterwards Aragorn uh, found an, a seedling of this tree high up on the mountains. So, and this is a nice family tree, but you can notice one thing in it. There is always just a single parent. So we have no other individuals of the same species of tree, just one plant reproducing basically clonally. Or mostly, uh, most probably it, it was either self-pollination or apomixis. Uh, Self-pollination is uh, pollination by its own pollen, and usually uh, plants want to prevent this because it doesn't lead to greater genetic variability. It basically creates 
something close to clones of the mother, mother plant. Uh, so it's usually a last resort and plants have different mechanisms to prevent this self-pollination. Uh, for example, they can have different lengths of the stamens and pistils. Uh, the stamens and pistils can ripen in, the, in different times or they can be genetically incompatible. And, and another, another way, because we, we know that uh, at least uh, the, uh, the two uh, last, last generations grew from, a, uh, grew from a fruit, and also from Nimrod was taken a fruit into Middle Earth. So it produced fruit. Uh, so the formation of a fruit with seeds, but without any prior fertilization, is also happening in plants. And it's, you can, you can uh, say it's, it's something like immaculated co uh, conception. But it's called apomixis, and it's quite common also in plants that, uh, that live in uh, harsh habitats where there are no pollinators, which should, when they creep to the uh, edge of uh, their own habitats and uh, colonize new areas, uh, where there are no pollination, so they either self-fertilize or rely on this apomixis, which really creates true clones, which probably happen here in, uh, in this white tree. Okay, not only created interesting trees, uh, but he created a race, an intelligent race, uh, which was charged with protecting these trees, something that he himself would really like to do. Uh, the creation of the ants uh, in the universe is explained by this, by this quote, uh, all have their word, said Yavana, and each contributes to the word of the others. But the Kevlar can flee uh, or defend themselves, <laughs> whereas the Olvar that grow cannot. And among these, I hold trees here. So as you can see, kelvar are animals and all of ours are plants. Long in the growing, swift shall they be in the felling. And unless they fail tall, they tall with fruit upon bow, a little more is their passing. So I see it in myself. Uh, would that the trees might speak on behalf of all things that have roots and punish those that wrong them. So this is uh, how the ants were created as a response to, to her spouse, Aule, uh, being a bit rebellious uh, against uh, the, uh, the creator Eru and creating his own race of dwarves, which, as, as you know, cut the trees to uh, make their uh, buildings and uh, to uh, smell their metals. Uh, but the, the creation of uh, ants or the idea of ants uh, came into Tolkien's head, as, as he said, uh, said about uh, uh, in a letter, uh, when he was thinking about Macbeth. Because he was quite disappointed by the story of Macbeth. Uh, he said that their part in the story is due, I think, to my bitter disappointment and disgust from school days with the shabby use made in Shakespeare of the coming of great Birnam Wood to the high Dunsinan Hill. So there is, there is a scene in, a, uh, in the Macbeth uh, where, where the uh, enemy army comes uh, uh, or marches uh, against Dunsinan uh, disguised as trees. So they are uh, taking three branches with them. And Tolkien was disappointed by this because he expected uh, that the forest itself, sh itself should march into battle. So he said, I long to devise a setting in which the trees might really march to war. So he, uh, in his uh, Middle Earth, he, uh, by the march of the ants, he wanted to amend this perceived mistake of Shakespeare and really make the trees march. which requires the trees to move. Uh, so how do plants move in our world? 
uh, they usually don't move from place to place, let's say. Uh, they don't walk away from your garden, but they can move their parts. Uh, very often this, these movements are uh, quite unnoticeable because they are very slow, like the ants are. That's why the, the language of the ants is, is very slow as well. It takes them whole uh, several hours to say good morning. Uh, the movements that uh, are to something or away from something are called tropism movements. They either uh, move towards light, towards towards nourishment, or towards gravity. As uh, the usually the green parts of the of the plant uh, move towards light, the roots move in the direction of the gravity, uh, the stems move against gravity. Uh, and this, this type of movements are usually connected with growth. Uh, the stems of the plants can bend and, uh, and move only if the plant is growing. That's, that's why uh, also the, in, uh, in some flowers that uh, uh, turn their, their flowers towards the light, uh, this turning uh, only happens while the plant is growing. And when it stops growing, it stays in the same position. Because these, these movements are controlled by a plant hormone called auxin. Uh, the auxin uh, causes the elongation of the cells. And it can distribute differently in the plants. Usually, and when we are talking about movement towards light, for example, uh, it concentrates in the shaded part of the plant. This means that the shaded part grows quicker. And as it grows quicker, the plant bends towards light. The same is with gravity and many different other, many other different tropism movements. Then we also have gnostic movements. Uh, we don't have to be connected uh, with growth, uh, and they are without any direction. So they are not towards something, but they are. There can be a response to something. For example, it can be the closing of leaves during day and night, or in the response to touch, as you can see. And sometimes these movements can can even be uh, noticeable by the by in our uh, timeline. So this, this would be quite fast for an end. Uh, this type of movements, this fast one, is called a variation movement uh, because it's caused by the change of uh, content of water in the cells. There are big vacuoles filled with, with water. And if you touch this plant, Mimosa, uh, it sends an electric signal towards the, the uh, cells at the base of these leaves. And uh, this electric signal causes uh, this water to be rapidly pumped out of the cell. So you can imagine it like uh, the cells at the base of the leaves rapidly uh, losing all water, and the, which causes this movement. So they do have something like, like we do, uh, which is this action potential, which is electric change uh, spreads through the cells of the plant and caused, for example, by this touch. Action potential is uh, how, uh, how information spreads through, your, uh, through the cells of your nerve system and through your muscles. So they, they uh, have something similar. We also, uh, in, in a token, besides this, uh, uh, this ends, which is a bit questionable if there are plants, uh, if there are more uh, like intelligent race, if they are animal based or something in between. Uh, but we we really have uh, walking trees, which are horns, which uh, could be the ends that, that grew more tree like or trees that grew more awakened. Uh, and, uh, and this is quite rare in our world. So the plants can move their parts, but usually then they don't walk away. There are a few exceptions. Uh, this palm tree, Socrates exoriza, living in uh, Latin America, 
and possibly also other species uh, that have uh, this kind of roots would move very slowly uh, because uh, they can form new roots and the old roots can die. And if it happens that the trunk is uh, slightly, uh, slightly bent, then the center of gravity shifts uh, and the new roots are formed on one side and die on the other side. And this, this way, the tree can sleep uh, and can creep very slowly uh, to two to three centimeters a day. Uh, it's probably just in unstable soil when the center of gravity shifts, but also possible when, when there is only light from one direction. As we saw, the plants can tilt towards light thanks to these growth movements, which was uh, controlled by auxin. And that's how the center of gravity can also shift. So the plant can walk towards light. And there is also a, one curious, curious case uh, recorded in India uh, in a mango tree, uh, nicknamed Shalto Ambo, uh, which is this also this interesting growth form of a trunk parallel to the ground. And it forms new roots where it touches the soil, while the old ones at the base of the, of the trunk die. And this way, the tree crawls slowly. Uh, its age is estimated to 1,300 years. We don't know if it has crawled all of this, this uh, age or if it got uh, is bent later, uh, but it was observed that it moved about 20 meters during two generations and about 200 meters in 250 years. So this is possible who are. Let's look at another interesting tree in Middle Earth, which is Old Man Willow. And Old Man Willow uh, is, is or was uh, by, by, this, uh, by its uh, lifestyle, something that we would, not, we would uh, call proto-carnivory. Uh, carnivorous plants uh, developed several times independently in the evolution of plant plants, uh, usually under nitrogen de deficiency. So if there is no nitrogen in the soil, which is often in the uh, swampy soils, uh, the, the plant need, needs to take in nitrogen in some other way. And the first step in this process is usually this proto-carnivory. Uh, when the plant uh, has some structures that can trap and kill insects. Usually, or, or first, uh, they could evolve by coincidence that some insects uh, died because they got stuck to the leaves which were sticky. Uh, so it's without active digestion of the insect, or in this case, of the hobbit. Uh, but the, the insects that die on this plant fertilize the soil. They are a natural fertilizer with a, containing nitrogen as it decomposes on the, uh, in the soil. Uh, and uh, even such an unassuming plant like shepherd's purse, Capsula burda pastoris, where it grows almost everywhere, small white flower, uh, its seeds have a, emit a sticky substance uh, that uh, attract that attracts and also glues uh, nematodes that live in the soil. This in this picture you can see the seeds of shepherd's purse and these uh, these lines uh, looking like li little threads are nematodes that got stuck in in the substances emitted by the seed and they fertilize the soil where the seed grows. And if it, it happens, the plant can grow better. So this is the case of Old Man Willow as well. It, kept, it tried to capture the hobbits. It wouldn't digest them directly, probably. Uh, but it would, the, the corpses would fertilize the soil where the uh, willow grows. And from this developed the, other, the next step, 
which was the ability to trap animals, but also directly digest their proteins, which we have in several carnivorous plants. And there is also a secret third, third step, which are some complicated symbiotic relationships with, with, for example, ants that, that help this, uh, this carnivorous plant to catch their prey, or with uh, mammals uh, that are not captured in this trap, they're too big, uh, but they can live there. They can, they can uh, use this plant as a hiding space and the plant feeds on its excrements. This is the case of this Netentes species in Borneo, uh, which attracts bats. It has a special shape of uh, its, uh, its leaves, so that it uh, reflects the echolocation of bats and it lets them know it's there and they use it as a hiding place. These were the interesting trees in Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth, that in broader sense. So let's look at the other vegetation. Of course, we have a uh, wild vegetation. Uh, but we mostly focus uh, in the story on the people. So let's, let's also focus on the vegetation that's influenced by people. Uh, in our world, it's called synanthropic vegetation. So the, the plants, uh, the distribution of which is influenced by humans. In Middle Earth, there are not only humans, there are elves, dwarves, ants. Uh, so if we would uh, want some, this term applied to Middle Earth, uh, then we would, would uh, need the definition influenced by uh, some intelligent race besides Ainur, because Ainur uh, can be viewed as the forces of nature. So this, the common name for these intelligent races in Middle Earth is Eruhini, the children of Eru, so it would possibly be seen Eruhinic vegetation. And, uh, and this species uh, that are not native in an ecosystem, that come from outside uh, and go to the, into the ecosystem by human, uh, human plus in the Middle Earth intervention, are called allochthonous species. They came to our area until the 15th century, they are called archaeophytes. So in Middle Earth, if you are looking for the par parallel, this would be until the end of the first age. Neophytes uh, are the plants that came to our area after the 15th century when uh, America was discovered and uh, the um, exchange of uh, plants and, and also animals became uh, between this old and new world. Uh, so in, in Middle Earth, uh, we have the end of first age marked by the rising of Numenor. So if a plant, plant comes from Numenor, it can be uh, considered a neophyte in the Middle Earth. We also have a term uh, apophytes, which are the native species that acquire new habitats through human can, or other races uh, activity. And invasive plants, uh, which is a term often used nowadays because we, we can have problems with these invasive plants, which are allochthonous species displacing native flora. So in Middle Earth, an archaeophyte would be, for example, wheat from Valinor. Neophytes would be plants like Malorn, Atlas, or Galena spite wheat. Let's look at, at the plants that uh, uh, are cultivated by humans or other races, uh, or so-called domesticated plants. In our world, uh, domestication of plants uh, was about uh, 10,000 years before present uh, and is associated with the climate change after the end of the last ice age. Until then, uh, we have no agriculture, no, no records about uh, uh, domesticated plants. Uh, but after the end of this uh, last ice age, uh, the conditions especially in the Middle East, became uh, drier. And there was a long dry period during, during the year, usually in summer, 
uh, which favored plants that were able to store nutrients to survive this period. And they either store them in seeds, which means that didn't actually survive this period as, as the plant. The plant died, but the seeds got into the soil, they survived there. And when the, when the, the conditions became wet again, it sprouted. Or in the, uh, it stored in, the plants can could store nutrients underground in tubers, uh, like tulips. So you, you can plant tulips in your garden. They flower in spring, and then you don't know about them for the all the all of the year because the the plant is is hidden in the bulb, in the ground, and next spring it sprouts again. And uh, because the plants needed this much energy to survive to store during this this uh, dry period, and the humans that live there could gather these parts of the plants and also get enough food to survive this, this unfavorable period without migrating. So this, uh, this ability to store enough food allowed the first permanent settlements. And when you have permanent settlements, you can also have agriculture because you stay in one place and you can plant the seeds there and wait until the next spring where, where the sprout. So this allowed the agriculture to emerge and it was uh, a conscious process. It wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't a chance process like that the people were eating something, they threw seeds and with surprise, they found that they have the plant, they knew how it worked and they cultivated uh, some, uh, species of plants uh, that were carefully selected. And in every area of the world where the domestication of plants happened, because it happened several times, this, uh, this uh, so-called fertile crescent was just the first where, where the conditions were favorable. Uh, it always happened in the packages of uh, uh, crops. And in this package, you always have a cereal and a legume. Uh, because uh, these two uh, kinds of uh, crops uh, balance the years of good and bad harvest. Because if you have a good harvest of wheat, there is a little worse harvest of uh, uh, the legumes and other, the other way around. And also, uh, they create a balanced diet of carbohydrates from cereals and proteins, which uh, the leg legumes are the main source of plant proteins. And uh, this was not without consequence for the plants. Uh, you can't uh, just take domesticated uh, uh, peas or domesticated uh, cereal and just release it into, into the nature and expect it to survive. Because by domestication, a lot of plants lost to the traits uh, that are advantages for the survival of the species in nature, but unsuitable for humans. Uh, for example, the seed dispersal. When you have uh, wild grasses, uh, the seeds from the spike uh, the, uh, fall down to the ground. If you would leave a weed without harvesting it, it would just rot on the stalk. The seeds wouldn't fall out of the spike. They wouldn't fall to the ground because the seed dispersal was something that the people who domesticated this the, the wheat selected against because they don't want to gather the seeds from the ground. They want to cut it and harvest it in the same time. Also dormancy of the seeds. Usually wild, wild plants uh, are, have, have seeds that need to go through a period of cold weather uh, for it to be able to sprout. The seeds of domesticated plants lost this trait because you plant them in spring when the time is right for and the temperature is right for them. So they don't have to care about the temperature. They know that you, you will plant them when it's suitable for them. Uh, also, also in the legumes, in, uh, in beans, 
uh, the, the, the pots of the beans don't open on the plant. So if you were to leave the beans on the stalk, they wouldn't fall down. They wouldn't be able to sprout naturally because the, the pots don't open. So this, this is called domestication syndrome. It's the traits of, of plants that uh, basically bind them to humans and leave them dependent on humans. Uh, in Arda, this, this situation was, of course, a bit different because we have Yavana, the genetic engineer who created directly the plants with desired properties without this process of uh, selecting the and the best individuals from the native from the natural species and taking them and selecting them, breeding them, domesticating them. This takes about 200 years from, by these nature natural uh, processes or the, the without some genetic engineering or or without knowing what exactly happens during the breeding uh, for the plant to go from the uh, native to domesticated form. We also know that antwives were uh, great gardeners and uh, possibly domesticated some species. And uh, this, uh, this domesticated sp species spread to other races. We didn't know about domestication by other races, but we know that the hobbies were uh, enthusiastic gardeners. So they, if they didn't domesticate some plants, if maybe they took it from the antwives, uh, but uh, they certainly did select them and breed them. Let's look at the, at the individual plants that we can find in the uh, Middle Earth and are mentioned in, in, in Tolkien's Legendarium. Uh, so this, so the only mentioned archaeophyte is this weed of Valinor which is the, the special wheat used to make lambas bread. Uh, it was created by Yavana in Valinor, and uh, it was sent to the elves when they marched west, when the Valar invited them to Valinor. So that's why it got to Middle Earth before the end of the First Age, and it can be considered an archaeophyte. Uh, it grow, grows uh, rapidly after sowing any time of the year, except when it freezes. The, uh, there are freezing conditions, uh, but it doesn't thrive in the shade of the plants of Middle Earth. So here we can see that there is a very low risk of invasiveness of this species because uh, it has uh, a low uh, ability to uh, withstand uh, their concurrence. Um, it's only grown in the sunny clearings of guarded elvish lands like Doriath and Lorien. It, it could only be picked by hand without a touch of uh, metal, uh, which can be an uh, echo of some uh, druidic traditions or uh, yeah. of the traditions of uh, picking magical and medicinal plants uh, with rituals. Uh, there, are, there are records about uh, some, some, species, some species of medicinal plants. Uh, you had to gather uh, only at midnight with your clothes uh, up, outwards uh, without any touch of metal. So this, this is an echo of uh, some old uh, folk traditions. Uh, and the only ones who could uh, handle uh, this plant and make land bus were elven women dev devoted to Yavana, called the Yavanildi. And the possession and gifting of land bus was the exclusive right of the queen or the highest ranking elven woman. So this is why the gift uh, of Galad Galadriel uh, of El Lambas to the Fellowship of the Ring was a big deal. It wasn't just here, here you are, there are some supplies for the road. There are just a few cases recorded where, where it was given to mortals. Uh, because long-term use by mortals leads to very easy from mortality and craving for Valinor. So it usually wasn't given to them. This is a, one of the few exceptions when Galadriel gave it to the fellowship. After the end of the first age uh, of Middle Earth, uh, there was uh, a great deal, deal of history there, the defeat of Melkor and uh, the, the 
humans already evolved and the humans who helped in the fight against Melkor was given the island of Númenor as a reward. And uh, Númenor is an interesting botanical case because we can see, uh, as with many islands, uh, the island endemism. In many islands, there are unique species growing. Uh, but in this case, we started from zero. Numenor was, uh, was raised from the, the bottom of the sea. So the, all the plants that got there was in, were introduced, usually from, uh, from Eresa, which is this island near the Valley North. Uh, so, the, so most of the flora of Numenor are Alachthanus plants uh, brought by Elvish sailors. Uh, besides this asterisk marked plants, which where we have no mention of introduction, but probably were introduced as well. We have records of uh, trees uh, in, uh, in Numenor, so-called the Nisimalda, which were fragrant evergreen trees uh, spreading from the Bay of Eldana inwards, because Eldana was where these Elvish sailors landed. Uh, there was oil aire for ever summer, uh, which was also used by a uh, Numenorean sailors as a green boss of, re of return. It was fastened to the ships to bless their journey and to ensure their return. Uh, Laire Lose, most of them we just know by name or it's a very short description. Uh, and the name also gives a bit of this description because Laire Lose means Summer snow white, or possibly white flowers. Nessa Melda was beloved by Nessa, which gives us information about the valley, but doesn't really tell us much about the plant itself. Also, Vardariana, which was Varda's crown gift. Taniquelase was leafed from Taniquetil. Yavana Mire was the jewel of Yavana, which there is a mention of round scarlet fruits of this tree. There was also Malinorne, or uh, in, a, in there in Malorn, golden tree. Lalinke, or in translation, golden, which had the long hanging clusters of yellow flowers and was one of the many trees in, a, in this region, Hierostar. And Lavaralda, uh, which was a, a tree or a high, high uh, uh, bush, uh, growing around Ellen Bill's house. It had long green leaves, golden underneath, and flowers white with yellow tinge, dense on branches. This is the longest description we get about a tree in Numenor, and it's from History of Middle Earth. And there, are, uh, there were also some herbs mentioned, like Atalas, Galenas, Eleanor, and Lisuin. Let's look, look at uh, um, some of the more interesting of them, or at least those we know more about. And the first one is again a tree, Malorn trees. So they were brought from Eresea to Numenor, and from Numenor they were brought to Middle Earth as a neophyte. They were, they were a gift from uh, Tar Aldarion, the sixth king of Numenor, to Gilgalad. But they didn't uh, really take hold in Linden where Gilgalad ruled. So he gave them to Galadriel, who planted them in Lorien and created basically a monoculture of Melirn, which is a plural of the word Malorn, uh, which is similar to beech forest. The beech forest uh, was uh, one of the trees that arrived uh, to, to the, at least our area of Central Europe uh, last, during, after the Ice Age, but created monocultures in uh, middle altitudes is because uh, these uh, beech trees can grow in shade. Their seedlings can sprout when they are shaded. So possibly this, this is a characteristic that these uh, malorn trees share with beech. And uh, Galadriel also gifted a, a seed of a malorn to some who planted it in the shire in the place of the Kadan celebration tree. So there was a malorn in the Shire. And the description of uh, this tree, uh, we know that it has a smooth silver bark and straight continuous trunk. Again, a trait that it shares with the beech. Also leaves were similar to beech. 
but larger, pale green above, silver below, and turning gold in autumn, but persisting through winter. Those flowers grew from spring to summer, they were golden, in clusters like cherry. So this is the main difference between the beech and this, uh, this malorn, uh, because when we have conspicuous flowers, uh, we know that this tree is insect pollinated. The beaches usually, have you ever seen a beech flower? Possibly not, because they are very inconspicuous. They are hanging from the, from the trees uh, in uh, uh, catkins, and they are pollinated by wind. So they don't need to be showy to attract insects. But in this, uh, in this malorn trees, we have showy flowers, so pollination by insects. The fruit is a nut with a silver shell, uh, but in the middle earth, they did not reach the size of those in Numenor. Even though in the, the, about the malorn trees in Car Carab Galadon, we have a quote that their height could not be guessed, but they stood up in the twilight like the living towers. So again, we, have, we get this problem how high these trees can grow if they look like living towers. Maybe they, sh they share this trait with these giant trees from the spring of Arda of this possible active water transport to reach this height. But the secret of uh, the fertility of the soil uh, of Lorien was not just uh, these mal malorn trees, but another, something else, which is mycorrhiza. Uh, there is a quote in, uh, uh, in the uh, in, in fellowship, at the end of the fellowship of the ring, where Galadriel give, give, gives gifts to the fellowship. Uh, and she says, in this box, there is earth from my orchard and such blessings as Galadriel, Galadriel has still to bestow is upon it. It will not keep you on your road, nor defend you against any peril, but if you keep it and see your home again at last, then perhaps it may, it may reward you. And though you shall find all barren and laid waste, there will be few gardens in middle earth that will bloom like your garden if you sprinkle the, this earth there. Why earth? Why doesn't she put this blessing into something else, into water, for example? Because in Earth, you can have fungi. This is the secret of all the land plants. They have symbiotic association of their roots with different fungi. Almost all vascular plants. Uh, when the plants got to the dry land, there were, uh, they didn't have roots. But the fungi were already there, and they served as the first roots of plants. And during Devonian, the plants developed roots, but they kept this, uh, this association where the fungus increases the absorption surface area for the water and minerals and increases the efficiency of their absorption. And the plant provides the fungus with photosynthetic products. So it's mutually favorable uh, relationships and possibly the fungi in, in Lorien uh, were special and uh, uh, could, could do this much more effectively than elsewhere in the Middle Earth. Another plant brought from Numenor to Middle Earth was Atlas. Uh, it still grows just on the sides of former settlements. It was also found in Beleriand during the First Age. Uh, it was it's described as fragrant evergreen plant with broad, shiny leaves. It doesn't grow in the open, only in the underground and in the north, only in the wild. In the forests of the south, it's quite common. It's used for headache, headaches. Uh, so we know that in the warm climate, it grows better than in the cold ones, which is true for several plants uh, that are coming to our area, coming more north, because the climate is shifting. And they can be invasive. So uh, in warmer climates, uh, there's possible invasiveness of this uh, herb, but we don't know enough about its distribution to uh, tell for certain. And uh, what we know is that it has strong medicinal properties. Uh, and I don't know if you have ever uh, thought about why the plants have medicinal properties. Why not animals? Why don't we take uh, 
some liver of some animals as a medicine, but we do take leaves of different plants in, in bees. It's because the immune, immune system of uh, animals is based on cells. There are white cells that circle through vein system and they, they serve to swallow the, or fight against uh, infections. But plants have no such system that would transport cells. They have no moving cells. Their cells have cell walls. So the, their immune system can't be based on these white blood cells, and they have to produce chemicals to fight infections. These chemicals are called, called secondary metabolites. They not only protect against bacteria, uh, but also against herbivores. They can make the plant taste bitter when it's eaten against fungi and different pathogens. And that's why we can take these chemicals and use them as medicine. And uh, I, I, I was uh, trying to find, since the, the book Atalas is described as uh, having broad shiny leaves, uh, but in the movie, the Atalas was quite different. Uh, and I, I took a long time to try to find the species that was used for this. I uh, wrote to Veta, but the, the person who was responsible for the greenery was not longer there, so the, uh, the trace ended there. But I found this, this species, uh, which grows in New Zealand, and it's quite similar to the movie Atlas, which is Lobelia angulata. So this is possibly the Atlas in the movie. And then we have pipeweed, Galenas, which also came to New, uh, Middle Earth from Numenor. Uh, it's, and Tolkien himself says it's a cultivar of the genus Nicotiana, possibly uh, even the Nicotiana tabacum, which is the tobacco plant in our world. It comes from Numenor, but it was naturalized in the lower reaches of Anduin. Uh, in Gondor, it was abundant under the name of Sweet Galenas. It grew larger than in the, in the north. And it produces a lot of small seeds, all of the, of the plants of this genus, uh, which uh, are a trait which is typical for invasive plants. So uh, it, it's possible that this galenas could be in, could be invasive in a warm I, warm climates, uh, similar to South American Nicotiana glauca, which is invasive in California and Africa. In the north, it only grew in warm, sheltered corners like Long Bottom. Uh, and southern slopes of Brie, and they were there, there they were discovered by Tobot Hornblower, who began their, their cultivation and was the inventor of smoking of these plants, at least, because the tradition of herb smoking by hobbits predates its discovery. Hobbits, hobbits were smoking different things before they discovered pipe bead, like in our areas in Europe, before, because the tobacco com comes from America, so uh, before that we smoke different things, like for example, pewter leaves. So the tobacco itself is, are dried, fermented leaves uh, of this plant, and it's just one of the two plants of American origin that you can find in Tolkien's legendary. So the, these plants of, uh, of American origin in our world are neophytes. So our neophytes in Middle Earth could be possibly seen uh, as anachronisms. Uh, and there are only tobacco and potatoes. There were tomatoes in the, in the uh, first editions of The Hobbit, but they were replaced by pickles. Uh, but not, not because Tolkien wanted to avoid this anachronism. There were, there were a lot of anachronisms in, in Shire. There were umbrellas, there were matches. They wanted to avoid linguistic, he wanted to avoid linguistic anachronisms because he was an etymologist and these words were of Native American origin. So that's why you don't have potatoes in Middle Earth, you have tatters. You don't have tobacco, you have pipe wheat. So that he anglicized the etymology to fit into his language. So that's why in the movie you have pumpkins which are corn, plants of Ameri American origin, which is not as much as linguistic anachronism, but you have tomatoes, which he specially erased from the Hobbit. And what would cause him the biggest 
uh, distress is probably this. He specifically renamed the potatoes to tatters. Let's get to other other plants. I don't. We have quarter hour, quarter an hour. So I will try to to do this more fast or faster. Uh, the plant you can uh, see in a Florian is Elanor. Uh, for in a, in a translation, star sun. It has small golden and silver flowers. Possibly in the same plant, looking like little stars. It was also brought from Erese to Numenor together with Lysuin for the wedding of Aldarion and Erendis. About Lysuin, we don't know anything else. It was possibly not brought from Middle Earth, uh, but Eleanor grew in Middle Earth in First Age in Doria and in Gondolin at the Sixth Gate and also on Glorfindel's grave. Galadriel probably took it from here along with Mithradil. And uh, Tolkien gives a resemblance of this, this plants to Pimpernel, Anagallis, uh, but says it has larger yellow or silver flowers. And what's interesting is uh, that we actually discovered a plant that looks just like he imagined. It's Lizzie Machiane Moru, a species which has yellow flowers, and according to the new molecular analysis, it should belong to this genus Anag Anagallis. So it's related, related and it grows in the temperate zone of, of Western and Central Europe in shady moist forests. So if you uh, find this, Lizzie Machiane Morum, you can, you can say you found Eleanor. And if uh, it's a little color of or snowdrop. So here we know it's, it's snowdrops. Uh, they were swaying on slender stems, white and pale green. They were first mentioned or first bloomed in Doria when Luthien was born, and together with Eleanor grew in Lorien. After Arvin's death, there neither Eleanor nor Mithradil, Mithradil bloomed in Middle Earth anymore. So after in the first, fourth age, later fourth age, you had no snow drops in Middle Earth. So he, he is said that it's similar or related to a snowdrop. Uh, which means it's possibly another species of the genus Galanthus. And Cymbalmine uh, is a plant called Evermine. It flowers all year round, especially on mounds. It's also mentioned in Gondolin between the fourth and fifth gate, uh, in Elendil Stomp, Amon Anvar, uh, on the mounds of the kings of Rohan, and uh, we know that it's possibly a species of the genus Anemone, which is wind flower, uh, similar to Anemone nemorosa. This is Anemone nemorosa. This is the movie symbol Mine, which is not a real plant. It was uh, made by, by the creative department. Uh, and why it grows on the mounds, it's uh, possibly the same reason why the uh, uh, poppy tree, po poppy seeds, uh, it's poppy flowers, uh, grew in the fields of uh, uh, of battle in Flanders fields and on the battlefields of World War II, World War One. Uh, it has a rich seed bank in the soil, but it's it has a low competitive ability in the grass, and that's why when you remove the grass by creating a mound or by bombing, they can grow. Then the another another. Other plants we have mentioned are, are Malos and Alfirin, just in one song sung by Legolas. Uh, the white lilies sway and the golden bells are shaken of Malos and Alfirin in the green fields of Lebanon in the wind from the sea. So, based on this description, uh, golden, golden bells, we can uh, uh, we have three suspects from the real flowers uh, of how these plants could look like. Fritillaria pudica from North America. It's, literally called yellow bells, or similar species from Greece or from Turkey. The next plants we have mentioned are Aeglos and Seregon, about the low slopes of Amon root. There grew thickets of Aeglos, but its steep gray head was bare, save for the red Seregon that mantled the stone. So Aeglos is described as a plant that's long legged sweet smelling, creating gloomy ailes 
beneath the roof of branches. It's also the name of the Ogamat sphere. It means snow point or icicle, which means it's possibly a white flowering relative of this, this plant, of course, Ulex europeus. The Saragon, in translation, blood of the stone, uh, is a stone crop, according to an aunt from Christopher Torkian, genus Sedum, which can also grow this uh, red color. Then we have flowers growing in the Morgul Vale. In, in this evil area corrupted by evil, uh, white flowers lay on either bank, shadowy meat meets filled with pale white flowers. Luminous, there were, were two, so my luminescence that we already mentioned, beautiful and yet horrible of shape, like the demented forms in an uneasy dream, and they gave forth a faint, sickening charnel smell. An odor of rottenness filled the air. What does this tell us? It tells us something about the pollination again. Because this, this is something that plants pollinated by flies and beetles do. Because they try, want to attract insects that are not interested, interested in nectar. They feed on decaying flesh, excrements, on fungi. So the plant mimics the smell of rotting flesh to attract this pollinator, possibly also in appearance. It's often thermogenic by uh, uh, reducing the efficiency of, of its respiration in mitochondria because uh, the heat helps the spread of these other substances. And uh, we have a flower that's, uh, uh, that, uh, that's called the stinkiest flower in the, uh, in the world, Amorphophallus titanum. It's called corpse flower because of the smell as, it, as it's flowering. This, this is quite a big one, so they, they probably didn't look like this, but I, I think that the smell could be uh, compared to, to this Amorphophallus titanum. We have a mention of uh, fumela, which were the flowers of sleep, uh, which were glowing red poppies that grew in the gardens of the Valla Lorien. Lorien, or Irmo, was the, was the Valla of sleep and dreams. So obviously these were the uh, flowers of Papaver somniferum, or poppy, uh, because uh, its latex is the source of opiates and narcotics. Uh, the lat the and cut uh, green poppy heads uh, can be milked for this uh, latex, and which which uh, uh, dried is, is sold as opium. And uh, the smoking of opium uh, was recorded since ancient times. It induced uh, did sleep with allegedly telepathic dreams. It, uh, use was recorded by Sumerians, the Egyptians in the antiquity. And it's also the source of morphine, which was an effective analgesic, analgetic, but highly addictive. It, because of these analgetic properties, uh, Lorien's uh, uh, wife was uh, Esther, which was a vala of healing. So uh, it's, it's not a coincidence that these this, uh, flowers grow, grew in their, uh, their uh, the space where they live. And Este. The, what's interesting is this description of glowing, because actually the poppy flowers, with some of them, glow under the UV light. And it's specifically a population of Europe, not the population or in the Middle East where this plant developed. Uh, but later it got to into our area is an archaeophyte together with wheat as a uh, plant growing among the wheat. But the, the thing is that in Europe, they don't have the original pollinator. They were pollinated by beetles. And beetles, these beetles can see red color. But bees can't see red color. But they can see in the UV spectrum. That's why the plants that got to Europe adjusted to this different type of pollinator and made their flowers attractive in the spectrum that's visible to the bees instead of the beetles. And some other species we have mentioned, just shortly, our, our Lebetron finger tree, uh, which gave the valuable black wood 
which possibly can be uh, ebony, the Ospiros crociflora, and the Kulomalda, golden, golden rain, which according to the unfinished index to the Lord of the Rings grew in the Cormalan field. It was Cormalan and it's golden circle. And possibly this golden rain, Laburnum anagineroides, which is a real plant, can be identified with la Laurinke from this new manor. And there are many other uh, so-called regular plants in Middle Earth. Uh, because really Tolkien was a lover of plants and you can, as a, or I can as a botanist, uh, really see that, that he perceived the plants that, uh, that were around him and he made the, uh, the composition of the flora in the different altitudes and different uh, latitudes uh, quite consistent and you can, you can uh, see the different uh, plant communities that grow in different uh, plant parts of Middle Earth. There, there is a book published about this flora of Middle Earth, which more talks more about this real plant that you can find in Middle Earth. So that's why uh, I base my lecture on this fantastic plants and how they relate to the plants in our world. So I, I hope. Uh, you took something about interesting from botany as well as, as from Tolkien. And if you have any questions, then you can ask them now. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Yes, uh, so anybody can ask some questions. We can give it like five more minutes. Professor, uh, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, I, I think, I guess I, I have this sort of dreaded comment and then question. My comment is um, just that I was so appreciative of the chance to think about these things from this botanical perspective. That's not something I've really ever run across in the literature on Tolkien's Legendarium. And uh, it, it was just, a really wonderful opportunity to be able to think about things in those terms. He was so interested in uh, on fairy stories uh, in this idea of subcreation and of making things fit uh, sort of maybe pseudo scientifically, if not scientifically. So I, I just really sort of appreciated that. Um, you talked a little bit about the idea of walking trees and of uh, sentience and sort of things like that. Uh, I was curious, the idea of sort of waking trees up. Um, do you have thoughts on that and its relationship in particular to sort of fungal networks um, and the, the sort of signals that travel across large fungal networks on Earth? Oh yes, I do, but that's about one hour, a one hour lecture. For <laughs> <laughs> I have a separate lecture about the perception of plants and how they perceive the world. So maybe, maybe sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. There really is no time for 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 that this now. Yeah, so it was a very informative lecture covering a whole lot of things and um, providing a good comparison between the the uh, sub-created world of Tolkien and our real world and maybe the parallels between um, between the aspects of both of these worlds on the botanical level. So thank you very much for the presentation. And now we will have a 30 minute lunch break and then uh, we will have the final session of today. Yeah.